The Titanic is one of the world's biggest tragedies and a lesson for everyone in hubris, overconfidence, and taunting the wrath of Mother Nature. When the pride of the White Star Line went down, failed not by the iceberg, but humanity, it was a stark lesson and there were a lot of human stories that either became part of or ended with the Titanic. Sadly, the Titanic tragedy, no pun intended, also became a boon for filmmakers and other artists. Indeed, the first film about the Titanic, Saved from the Titanic, came out only 29 days after the sinking and was written by a Titanic survivor. Today, that film has been lost to a studio of fire. Two other films came out the same year. 18 movies either tell a story about the Titanic, not always the Titanic story, or have the Titanic as a major plot point. The most recent is Holmes and Watson, but the most famous is of course James Cameron's 1997 masterpiece, Titanic. Or, if you watch YouTube, the most famous Titanic movies are of course the animated North Korean Italian Titanic sequels In Search of the Titanic. What about the Titanic with a little connection to the actual events or what we are here to talk about today as we explore the preteen book series Titanic, a three-part novel written by Gordon Coleman and published in 2011. Remember to subscribe and like this video. I release videos at least once a week, oftentimes more, and your support is appreciated. Gordon Corman is a name most Canadian children and many American ones too are accustomed to. Although he has never had a book that instantly catapulted him to fame and fortune as many other children's authors have, the number one New York Times bestselling author has seen over 27 million copies of his 80 plus books sold. He is also one of my personal favorite childhood authors, and I still reread his books regularly. Getting his start as a teenager, his first book was published by Scholastic while he was still in school. Book, This Can't Be Happening in McDonald Hall, followed the exploits of two young troublemakers at a prestigious all-boys boarding school near Toronto and the neighboring all-girls finishing school. An instant success, it was followed by six sequels and in 2016 was turned into a TV movie. In the early 2000s, he branched out from comedy novels to begin writing more adventure-focused novels, finding success with three trilogies, Island, Everest, and Die, and slightly later with, with the Connected on the Run and Kidnapped series. Each of these series followed a group of four or so pre-teens or young teenagers on some sort of adventure. Island told the story of four troubled teens sent on a scared, straight-style voyage shipwrecked on a seemingly deserted island. Everest was about a group of kids attempting to scale Everest and become the youngest to do so. And Dive told the story of four kids bored out of their minds on what should have been a trip of a lifetime to be assistants at a Caribbean nautical research facility. And in 2011, the Titanic series came out. Once again featuring a cast of four core preteens, the story tells a fictionalized version of the Titanic's voyage from their points of view. This isn't a problem, nor is the fictionalization. And unlike some of the films I mentioned earlier, this book was in many ways historically accurate and had a lot of research put into it. However, that doesn't stop it from going batshit insane. For these three books, I wrote more than eight pages of notes, and these were very brief reminders to go back and look at things. This was not a plot somewhere I wrote a note. This book went crazy. Like always, I'll try not to give away too detailed of a plot summary, but some things just can't be avoided, because I want to talk about the good and the bad of the plot, story, and characters. Book 1, subtitled Unsinkable, begins by showing passengers on board the Carpathia shocked and horrified by what they had just witnessed and survived, the sinking of the OMS Titanic. While some would say this removes a good chunk of what will happen in dynamic, this is hogwash because by now everybody knows what happened to the Titanic. We call events Titanic light. It then flashes back to numerous days before the boarding of the ship to Belfast, where a pair of young street urchins, Patty and Daniel, are putting on one of their typical dramatized fights in order to steal a pocketbook or billfold. They are successful, stealing a quite fat wallet, though they are unaware that the owner will be a continuous thorn for the rest of the books, because they don't yet, and neither does the reader know, that their victim is actually the brother of Belfast's biggest mobster, James Gilhooley. Both are street boys, one a runaway and the other an orphan, and survive by theft. Daniel, however, is quite bright and has the potential to be an engineer, except for the lack of money. On the way back home, they run into Sir Andrew Thomas, the designer of the Titanic. Daniel is awed and talks to a very polite Thomas who tells them in response to a boast that if he could find a way that the Titanic could sink, he could bring it to him and that he would tell his men to be expecting them. Daniel begins much work on it. 
In another part of England, Sophie Blonson is scolding her mother after her mother, Amelia Blonson, is arrested while giving a suffragette speech. Sophie is arrested alongside her after a series of altercations, and the Americans get sent to jail. Meanwhile, as Daniel works, Patty goes out to look for some food. He's successful, though after trying to spend one of the bills from the wallet the pike pocket a few days past, he is confronted by Gil Hooley and his main bodyguard, Seamus, who give chase. Daniel at the same time comes up with a way the Titanic could sink, and is on his way to show Sir Thomas. Arriving home, Patty realizes what has happened and runs for the shipyards to warn Daniel. Unfortunately, Daniel is killed by the thugs as Patty ends up accidentally put onto the Titanic as a stowaway hidden in blankets. As this occurs, the Earl of Glamford and his daughter, Juliana, are on an aeroplane ride in a small plane driven by the Earl. They buzz the Titanic to Juliana's horror, and the Earl asks her if she's excited for the upcoming voyage on the ship. She is for a tour and business meetings. The final member of the main cast is Alfie Huggins, the son of a sailor on the Titanic whose mum has abandoned him for a different life. Desperate to be bored with his one remaining parent, he lies about his age and gets a job as a junior steward in the first class section of the Titanic. Some days pass and everyone gets on board the ship. Besides the cast, there are numerous other members of the passengers and crew that will play an important role. Notably, there is First Officer Lightholder, Captain E. J. Smith, Titanic designer Sir Andrew Thomas, and the managing director of the steam line, Mr. J. Bruce Inslee. All of these men are real-life passengers of the Titanic, although not all of the actions on the boat that happened in the book happened in real life. There were a good many did. On the passenger side, prominent characters included third-class passenger and mother of four, Miss Rankin, old military man Major Mountjoy, and Mr. Masterson, a cripple. There were also cameos by the rich and famous who were on the boat, such as Astro, Vanderbilt, and Curto. None of the major characters initially know each other, although Patty and Alfie have met. Though scared of helping a stowaway, Patty blackmails Alfie into helping him as otherwise he will expose the fact that he is underage and he will be kicked off the Titanic. Within the first day, many things happen. The girls meet as Sophie and her mum are signed up to the Titanic's first class sender by policemen. Sophie and Juliana are both introduced and immediately bored by Major Mountjoy, or Major Mount much chop as they call him for his long beard. Masterson is miserable to people, an accident having reduced most of the use of his legs long ago, and he is grumpy about it. Alfie and Patty find a mysterious scrapbook in the luggage hold, though don't know what bag it may have been in. This is the point where the book jumps the shark and decides that telling a story of four unlikely friends on the Titanic is not enough. No, it needs to introduce a poorly constructed mystery. It really is. We find out the solution very quickly and introduce one of the most legendarily reviled figures in English history, Jack the Ripper. You know, some Titanic media have talking mice. Some Titanic media have Atlantis. This Titanic media has Jack the Ripper, the Whitechapel murderer. But this is only one of the many fun adventures that our protagonist will have. Yo, whew. Patty at this point decides that maybe the Titanic isn't the best place to be, and decides that before they leave Ireland, on the last stop, he will get off. But then his pursuer, Gil Hooley and Seamus, come aboard. He escapes, but will he forever? The voyage continues, and the captain is all but two boilers started to increase the speed, ignoring only signs of more ice ahead. He's also warned that there are not enough binoculars for the crow's nest. Patty continues to hide, Alfie continues to serve, and makes friends with both Sophie and Juliana. Sophie and Juliana have quarreled, but generally enjoy each other's company and enjoy keeping each other less bored when Major Mountjoy tells the stories that makes them so incredibly bored that when he tells of his adventure hunting man eating lions, they secretly cheer for the lion. Amelia Blonson makes men mad with her suffragette speeches, and the Earl gambles as is his habit. Julianne and Sophie do learn about Patty from Alfie, though accidentally, because as he is going down to show them the Whippers scrapbook, they see Patty steal a trunk, and Sophie and Julianne, despite Alfie's best attempts to foil them, fall and corner at Patty as he is dumping stuff out of the luggage into the sea, and Alfie accidentally lets it slip that he knows him. Sophie is for it, while Julianne hates the very idea. The next day or so, Patty is caught sleeping in late, but because of his uniform, they think he is just shirking duty and make him get the quartermaster's book of luggage. He can't, and forces Alfie to get it. Meanwhile, Lightholder yells at a waiting Patty and asks him who he is, to which he replies, Alfie Huggins. He is not believed because John Huggins is not Irish, and Patty is. Running away, he runs into Gil Hooley and runs again. These three sets of people, Paddy, Gil, Hooley, and Lightholder, are not friends, and will continue to be enemies and settle a lot of the action throughout the book. Gil Hooley catches Paddy, 
and takes him to an abandoned part of the ship to be killed and thrown overboard by Seamus. But Alfie, finding Patty missing, had teamed up with Sophie, Julian who wouldn't condone the activity, and found him saving them at the very last moment. Crewmen surround Gilhuli and force him and his bodyguard into the shipboard jail, but he sent them a crony, a type of ship-to-ship -ship and ship-to-land telegram system, message to his brother James about what is happening. James is furious, and we see that Daniel didn't die, but is instead basically a slave at the gang's hideouts, working and cleaning. He is happy that Patty is aboard the Titanic, but James assures him that he will soon be dead. And that's book one. We'll get to book two and three in a minute, but first let's take a quick look at what does and doesn't work with in book one. There is a lot of drama and adventure in the first book, and that is because, as the first book, it has a lot of jobs to do. It has to set the stage, introduce the characters, start forming relationships and creating drama, adventure, and mystery for the next books to continue and resolve. It also needs to start dropping hints that the voyage is not as perfect as it seems and that danger in many ways is looming ahead. Our four main protagonists, Alfie Huggins, Sophie Bronson, Julia Glam, and Patty Burns, represent four very different worlds, and one that could very well exist on the Titanic. Sophie and Juliana represent the upper crust of society, a merchant's daughter, and the daughter of the, at the time, declining arist aristocracy. Alfie represents the working poor, and somebody who has to work hard for survival, someone you could very well see working on a ship like the Titanic. And Patty represents the very poor, and downtrodden, the type of person desperate to escape to the new world. This unlikely band of eventual friends shows the class and racial, English and Irish and American, the tensions very much present in England at the time. Julianne looks down at Alfie and Patty because they are poor, and because Patty is a stowaway, a criminal in her mind at least initially, and at Alfie because although Julianne, and I quote, had grown up with servants, was fond of some, and respected most, but their function was no different from that of any other useful item like a broom. This entitled worldview we see Julianne have is at least mostly accurate, and something that we will watch Julianne slowly grow out of. We were also seeing a lot of the political issues of the time, such as in Irish English uneasiness, partly thanks to the bungled response to the real life Irish potato famine, the cause of suffragettes and female rights, and the slowly declining power and wealth of the aristocracy played out in this microorganism of the ship. It is interesting to see how these alter the reactions of various characters and how characters interact with each other from distrust to trying to keep a facade of perfection or dignity in even the most indecent of situations. I will get to an explanation of reality versus fiction at the end of the summary of all three books, but currently Gordon Coleman is doing fairly well, not stretching the overall narrative of the books too much except to fit his characters and the mystery of Jack the Ripper into the story. And don't worry, we will talk a lot more about Jack the Ripper later. But for now, let's move on to book two, Collision Course. I'm not going to go into as much detail about the plot of book two or three because it is not necessary, and I want to respect the work that went into the book by not spoiling it all. Collision Course follows the ship from where book one left off, a few days into the voyage, all the way up to when the captain realizes that the Titanic is doomed, but most passengers have only felt a light bump. Between these two plot points, a lot happens. So much happens that it makes the first book look like a boring stroll through the park in comparison. It opens with a crew member trying to convince Miss Franken that she has four kids and not five. She insists she does have five kids, and he leaves to get a passenger manifest to prove her wrong. She did only have four kids, two younger and two older, but she has been hiding Patty from pursuers. After this, he leaves at her urging and goes back to hiding and tells him that she'll be fine. When the crewman comes back, she explains, she'll tell him that she's had four kids and that he thought she had five. This is a funny scene and a joke that made me laugh quite a bit. Alfie shows Sophie and Juliana a party in the third class where Patty's already having a great time and everything is going smoothly until Major Muttonchop happens to see them and tells the Earl who makes Lighthole go in and get them. He does, sees Patty and what more hijinks ensue. Hijinks will ensue a lot. Later, Patty and Alfie find the owner of the scrapbook, or at least what room he's in, though they don't yet know who he is. Much and Chops annoys more people with his stories, Madison annoys the hell out of Sophie's mum with his misogyny, and is forced to his room thanks to an accident with Cherry Jubilee in the dining room. Alfie and Patty explore, Julianne has her eyes slowly open to the plight of the last fortune, and Patty is chased by Lighthaller. A lot. We also find out that the business the Earl has been planning on doing in America is the marriage of his daughter Juliana to an oil tycoon in New York to rebuild the family fortune and give the hard castles nobility. 
we find out who Jack the Ripper is, Ace gets closer, and the captain is warned, and he and Ismay turn the speed of the Titanic up by lighting the final two boilers. And Patty is finally caught by Lightholder and is locked in the brig beside, but not in the same cell, as Gil Julian's shaman. Alfie tells Sophie the identity of the Ripper, and Sophie confronts him, but is rebuffed and told to go to a small deck later that night. Later that night on the deck, she moves around and is attacked by Jack the Ripper, and he reveals his master plan and why he stopped attacking all those years ago despite his mission. She is rescued at the last minute as she's about to fall overboard, murdered by the Ripper, by the ship hitting the iceberg. Irony, I know. And then Alfie, who was alerted to this meeting by Julianne, they run away, thinking that Jack is unconscious. The four then go to rescue Patty and Dew, with Patty also refusing to leave without releasing Gil Julian Seamus, which the other three are unsure and shocked about. He does this alone and runs off as the captain gets word that the ship is doomed. This book sees character development and a continuation of the adventure, though the overlying mystery of who Jack the Ripper is is solved, although they still within the book have to deal with this information. However, we also see a sharp rise in the excitement and urgency in the plot as the Titanic is now sinking and they have to get off. Character development sees the four starting to understand where they are each coming from, especially for Juliana, who moved from a spoiled daughter of luxury to someone who felt her entire life was a lie and who, for the first time, is starting to understand that people like Alfie and Patty have lives of their own and weren't just things for her to use. Not only that, we see another political issue of arranged marriages and how, though this can be used by some people to boost their standing, this is not something that was good in many cases for the people that were going to be arranged marriage. Let's quickly go through the third book so that we can see how the trilogy concludes and get to the analysis of the books and the actual Titanic and what we can and should make of it. The final book is called S.O.S., which is appropriate because the overall action of the book is about people trying to save themselves. It opens with the Californian, the closest ship in the Macroni room where they have neglected to properly crank it, meaning messages cannot get to them. To be honest, I wrote pages and pages of notes about this book in particular because there was a lot of stuff going on. More than the first and second book combined, probably. But I, there's so much happening at the same time in different areas, but I'm going to try and keep it brief. As the Titanic sinks and the California remains unmoving, not knowing about the disaster, the Carpathia is steaming full speed ahead towards the Titanic, but is very far away and probably won't make it in time. On the boat, the captain and crew are attempting to let people know the seriousness of the event, but many on the Titanic don't believe it. How could it go wrong? It's unsinkable. The Earl is winning at cards and refuses to go. Amelia wants to refuse to go first because women and children first is sexist, and Patty is still running from Light Holder as he tries to escape. Alfie is helping others escape. Julianne is given a baby that Patty finds to take care of as she is loaded into one of the few lifeboats, and Alfie's dad tells him that he is going to go down with the ship, but to save others and himself. More hijinks ensue, with Sophie tricking her mummy into a lifeboat, but not getting into one herself, and the ship is slowly sinking. Ms. Rankin and her two younger sons are allowed into a lifeboat, though her oldest are not, to her chagrin, and Alfie finds a floating pantry to stay on as the ship sinks. Patty grabs hold of an inflatable lifeboat, but isn't allowed on because there was no room. Sophie is thrown into water, and Jack the Ripper survives, floating somewhere in the sea. Alfie and Sophie find each other, but so does Jack the Ripper. Patty is allowed on the lifeboat and finds Lightholder who is taking command of survival, telling people that nobody is allowed to die, and that's the order. And the Carpathia continues to come closer. The Titanic is now completely gone. More stuff happens, what a shock, I know. And the book ends in a longer story, telling the reader what happened to everyone. Julianne and the baby go back to England after a brief stint with Sophie's family. Sophie's mum gets arrested again for suffragette speeches. And Sophie is embarrassed, but they plan on keeping in touch between Juliana and Sophie. Patty is living well in the USA with three jobs until the girl Hoolies again begin stalking him. He runs in, away and hides low, but they end up finding him. But it's good. As thanks for saving Kevin and Seamus, Kevin has brought Daniel to the New World and gives him a big bag of money courtesy of James Gohuli. He also offers them jobs, but they refuse and tell him that they are going to spend the money to get Daniel to school, where he can become a great engineer and maybe build a ship that wasn't so single. And Alfie. Alfie is Gordon Corman's version, James Cameron's Jack. He dies of hypothermia in the water, despite almost being rescued by the Carpathia. His final scene sees him on the deck of the Titanic by the grand staircase. His mom and dad are there, dressed to the nines, and together they walk up the staircases, presumably into the afterlife.
So that's the Titanic. It was less to unpack in the third book specifically because it is mostly action oriented. So let's get into the analysis of the series overall. There has to be some degrees of ethics used when writing or making art based on a real life tragedy because it was real people, not characters that suffered. That is why usually you find fictional characters as the main characters in such a piece of art and occasionally use real people as background characters as this book does with its four leads and their ship's crew. And when you're using these real people, you have a duty to ensure that they are staying fairly true to themselves and they accept the narrative of what happened. Of course, you can have them say and do things that may not have happened, and you can have them interact with your made-up characters, but they must be kept mostly true. You can't suddenly have E.G. James be the Jack the Ripper, and he's not in this book. Here, Gordon Coleman successfully does that. One thing that he has mentioned in interviews and on his website is that he does a lot of research before writing of his adventure books to see how people could survive on a deserted island, or to see what happened on the Titanic, and it shows as the vast majority of the actions that the real-life characters from Light Holders or Colonel Astor, the captain and the managing director of White Star Line do are supposedly true. This includes Astor cutting up a life jacket he finds to show his wife the cook, Ismay getting the captain to light all the boilers, and there were not being enough binoculars for the crow's nest. Let's talk about the reason you came. Jack the Ripper. Did a book about the tragedy of the Titanic also need to have a major plot thread about finding out who among the passengers was Jack the Ripper? No. Was it necessary at any point? No. Was it kind of awesome? Yes and no. No. Well, technically possible that Jack the Ripper was on the Titanic on his maiden voyage, it is rather unlikely. I, I said rather unlikely. <laughs> I mean astronomically unlikely. That kind of coincidence would be one of those cosmic quirks. He was most likely brought in because the books needed another antagonist, besides Gil Hooley and Lightholder, who the rest of the characters, Juliana, Sophie, and Alfie, could deal with during the lull of the book. If there wasn't another antagonist, most of the action would send to Patty, already arguably the main character, as he would be the only one to have an antagonist working against him, Gil Hooley and Lightholder. It could have been any random murderer or criminal. But the choice of Jack the Ripper was, I believe, very intentional. Not only does it remove the need to go into detail about what happened or why this character is to be feared, but it also links another famous event from around the same time. Jack performed his deeds in the late 1880s and lets the author give a different conclusion to Jack's saga and what happened to Jack the Ripper and why the Whitechapel murder suddenly stopped. I'm not going to tell you what happened to Jack the Ripper in the book or why the murder stopped within the book and what Jack's new Titanic master plan was, but let it be clear that within the book's universe, it is plausible. Real life, less so, but you never know. And one problem with adding Jack the Ripper's character here is that it is Jack the Ripper and it is an important thing on its own. It doesn't need to interrupt the story of the Titanic to tell it. It is its own tragedy. But these are just small details to the real moral of this book and of the Titanic tragedy in whole. Like I said in the opening, the tale of the Titanic is a tale of hubris. We built an unsinkable ship, so why would we worry about lifeboats or steaming full speed ahead into a dangerous ice field? The ship was unsinkable. It was the greatest ship ever conceived. Nothing could happen to it, so why worry about something happening? Go for the glory of arriving early. Go for it. Ignore the needs for a proper number of binoculars. Ignore it all, because the Titanic is the Titanic, the pride of the White Star Line, the greatest shipping line ever. The Titanic is something that we shouldn't forget. It is unlike almost any other event we've ever seen. The Hindenburg designers knew the dangers of hydrogen, but had no other choice because of the war. Charlotte Noble was just an accident. But the Titanic was something else, negligence. And I think that we should continue to talk about the Titanic as a cautionary tale. The more that we share and we tell the story, the better, but we have to retell it in the right way. That is the difference between something like this and something like James Cameron's Titanic versus something like Legend of the Titanic or Search for the Titanic. The Titanic is not a comedy, and it is not something that we should laugh at. It is something we should mourn and promise to be better at, because otherwise, as historians say, we will be doomed to repeat it. And the Titanic is not something that we should repeat.